Eschatology. That is a word that my friends and family have heard me say over the years, and I know that they like to run from me when I would get on my eschatology discussions. <laughs> Not as precedent now for me as it was before. Um, but before I explain to you what that word means, I will state first that generally there are three reactions to when you learn what that word actually encompasses. Those that don't care, those that do care, but are thoroughly confused, so avoid it. And then the third one is those that beat it like it's a dead horse with an ivory stick. And I have been accused of the latter at times, but uh, I've actually begun to settle down in my elderly age. <laughs> oh, kidding aside, eschatology should be something that every Christian should care about. And the reason why the core definition is the branch of theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of all humankind. That's kind of important. Amen? It's the biblical study of end times. The end of the age, we all should have some basic understanding in the study of things to come, because it does affect us all. I urge people to study the words of Scripture um, to understand that Jesus gave us a great deal of information about this topic. And if we're studying the words of Jesus, we have to study the words of everything he has told us. There's a lot of debate about how Jesus returns, but there is no debate among true believers that he will return. Amen. Amen. Regardless of where you are in your understanding or interest in this topic of eschatology, we must study the words of our Lord. We are going through the book of Mark, and we arrive at the 13th chapter, and this is what he talked about. It's called the Olivet Discourse because he taught it from the Mount of Olives. And the return of Christ, or his second advent, is, is actually an essential to the pillar of our faith. It's an essential doctrine to salvation. How it happens is a non-essential, debatable topic, but the return is essential. Today, we're going to focus on the entirety of chapter 13. However, before we begin, I would like to ask you to please stand with me as I read from Matthew 10, a completely different subject in our call to worship this morning, because I want you to see some tough words from our Lord. 10, 34 through 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Praise God for the reading of his word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Lord, as your church worldwide, is your children gathered. We pray, Lord, that our brothers and sisters around the world do not get astray any longer with bad teaching, false teaching. We pray, Lord God, that the truth of your scripture permeates from the pulpit all around the world. I pray, Lord God, that we all have ears to hear this morning, write your words upon our hearts, and protect us as we go out into the world among wolves to be a light to those who are meant to be called out of the darkness. I pray, Lord God, that you would not allow me to get in the way of your message going forward this morning. No matter how much work I've done to prepare this, if it's not you who gets all the glory and you who uh, moves me by way of your spirit, then I, I am failing you. So I pray, Lord God, you just use me as an unworthy vessel to speak your truth this morning by way of your spirit to your children, all for your glory, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ aren't always filled with rainbows and lollipops, my friends, as I read to you in Matthew 10. And those words are hard for people to hear because some people take it to a point of going, well, I really like my daughter-in-law. <laughs> That's fine. That's good. Good for you. You should, right? You should like your family. You love your family. 
Jesus' point is that his coming, his truth will divide. There are family members who will not like you. They will maybe remove themselves from you because of your faith. It happens. It's not easy to hear. None of us want to hear that, but we all know it does. Now, when we realize that everything that Jesus said is something that we have got to study unanimously, then we also understand that we have to listen to what he says rather than what tradition has told us. I'm, come on. Is it about him or is it about what we think it should be about him? It's about him. As we enter the 13th chapter of the book of Mark, we're going to be reminded even more that the difficult teachings of Jesus are precedent. And when I say difficult, I don't mean difficult to comprehend. They're difficult to accept. At some point, that bears true to each of us. Amen? <clears throat> Pardon me. If one <clears throat> is soft in their knowledge of Jesus, then they are going to be caught off guard when they're told by Jesus to turn away from sin. There is nobody that talked more about hell in the Bible than our Savior. People don't know that. Because they do that with it. When we read this, we understand that Jesus is like, you got to turn away from sin. you got to turn away from sin. It's only through him that we can do this. Otherwise, it's in vain. We're going to begin with, I'm going to break down the entire chapter, 13th chapter today. Um, we're going to begin with verses 1 and 2. You can follow along in scripture. We will have it on the screen behind me or for those of you watching at home. And he came out of the temple. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be one left here upon a, one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Wow. That's pretty descriptive. Turns out to be extremely prophetic as well. So well, you got one of the disciples ooing and aahing. Look at the beautiful architecture, Lord. And Jesus pops his bubble. It's going to tumble. That is the destruction of Jerusalem that would occur 37 years later in 70 AD. This destruction in and of itself is not discussed in Scripture which is interesting enough because it's actually well documented historically by both Roman and Jewish accounts, which is amazing. Uh, but there's not really, there's nothing else. There's a lot of things that allude to it, but nothing that's descriptive about what actually happened. Well, we don't need to know what happened because Jesus told us what was going to happen. Right? So if he told us what was going to happen and it did, then we know that everything he said was true. Jewish historian Josephus has written, had written accounts. Josephus is really interesting because he's extremely a solid historian um, as a Jew. So he has a lot of written stuff. He was also the mediator between Rome and Judea, which was, I think was really interesting because of some of the way some of this description is written. It's almost like he's sort of still appealing to the Romans so that they won't fully eradicate everybody and kill them. But it doesn't matter. This battle was not a battle. When you hear the destruction of Jerusalem or the siege of Jerusalem, folks, please hear me on this. It lasted for several months and 1.1 million people died. That's not chump numbers. I would hearken back to any war and see how that one compares. 1.1 million people combined mostly Jews and Romans. That's a war. That's a war. Although the actual number of how many of each were lost, it doesn't matter. That's a total number of both groups. Josephus goes on to report that Romans killed armed um, people, elderly people, children, and 97,000 were enslaved and some were let go and freed. But before the siege occurred, there were multiple waves of desertions from the city. 
He reported this. Ironic, yet not shocking, many Christians, if not all of the Christians, fled prior to the city being surrounded because Jesus tells them to get out when they saw the signs. Now, more on that in a moment. Mark 13, 3 and 4, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Okay, not, wasn't great in school, but I do remember conjunctions. There's a conjunction, the word and, and it's vitally important that you see the word in there. When will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, Matthew 24 goes a little more explicitly. When will these things be and what will be the sign of the end of the age? Okay, so, so the disciples are asking Jesus, well, when is this destruction that you're talking about in Jerusalem going to happen, and what will be the end? What are the signs of the end? They have no idea that we would be in a 2,000-year mark of when all these things would occur, roughly. They don't care about time. They're worried about when he's going to return. All they know is he's going to go away. He's been talking about it. He hasn't even gone to the cross yet, ladies and gentlemen. But they want to know when this, this, this thing is going to occur, this destruction. All these stones of this beautiful buildings you're talking about are going to topple over. Well, when is this going to happen? And what are the signs of the end of the age? That's a simple conjunction of a question. It's two parts. And he answers with one answer. So that one answer answers what? Both. Both. Mark 13 Five. And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, in verse 6, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Now, Birth pains, women, ladies that have given birth to a child, Lord bless you. Um, now you understand what it's like for a man to have a cold. <laughs> uh, we men get, uh, we men are really good at being sick, aren't we? And you women have to go through birth pains. God bless you. Well, Jesus uses this analogy because if you understand the pain of birth pains, you also understand that you're not in labor yet. You're getting there. It's on its way, but you're not quite yet to the finality. Great analogy, one that I think women understand even better than men, but men have an idea, especially when they're standing by her, getting lots of French words spoken to them while they're holding her hand in labor. Let us examine this analogy for a moment. The time leading up to the temple's destruction, there were many false messiahs. Here's why, you guys. There were so many people who did not, did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There were many Jews who did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. Now, the, the word went forward and Jews were um, repenting and believing, accepting Christ as their savior. They were realizing he was the fulfillment of, of the messianic promise. But there were a lot of people who rejected this. And they wanted so badly to have the joy that they were seeing in Christians, I believe this, that they were beginning to, you know, there's always somebody, right? Like anytime there's a disaster, come on, 9-11, and then Walmart has a bunch of, you know, never forget 9-11, right? Got, you know, God bless America t-shirts, there's 17 tables in the front end, and everybody's buying them and wearing them. It's capitalism at its finest, okay? And actually, it's worse because it's sickening when we take advantage of things like this. Easter, as soon as Valentine's candy isn't even on 50% sale, they already have aisles of Easter candy. I'm like, can, I, can a brother please get the 50% off first? 
right? So that's, that's just now, now take that, but take that mentality that you and I are familiar with here in the States and think about this. Christ is the fulfillment. People are repenting and believing. They're falling in love with Jesus. They miss the boat. They miss the boat. So people are now sneaking in. Well, I'm the Messiah. I'm the Messiah. This happened. It's well documented that this happened in droves. So when we read this, we're thinking only of ourselves at the end of the age. But I want you to remember always when you read something like this, that it's a prophetic eventual fulfillment that Christ gave to us. We look no more at the past to understand the future. Jesus warns of wars and rumors of wars in verse 7. They're widespread between the period of Christ's resurrection and the fall of Jerusalem. Um, we see that in our day now. We have had more wars and rumors of wars since the turn of the uh, 19th and the, or the 20th in, in the century. And now we know that we've had more in the last 125 years than they had in all of period of time between Jerusalem and 1899 together. So you look at birth pains as your indicator. Also, the revolt against uh, that broke out in Jerusalem in 8040, and I think this is interesting because when Jesus was talking to them in this age, this generation will not pass away until these things come to be. Think about what happened here. AD 40, uh, Roman Emperor Caligula put a statue of himself in the Jewish temple and then sacrificed a pig. They were pretty angry at this. Earthquakes of famines of what Jesus spoke about also happened. Widespread famine broke out under the reign of Emperor Claudius. And those who followed Caligula, uh, that's who followed Caligula on uh, Rome's throne. And then the earthquake that destroyed Pompeii, which is a large city in Italy in 63 AD, occurred. So other instances of natural disasters happened, and these signs would precede the end, but they would only begin the tribulation and befall what would happen in 70 AD. More trouble would come to Jerusalem before that year. So Jesus spoke about this, and we can read that and then go, wow, he, everything he said came to fruition. And now we remember that he's answering duality. We have to look at what the application is to the end of the age. Now, does that mean that we're at the end of the age now? No. No, it doesn't. But I have, think that we all have a hunch that we're in the final hours. You know, it's, it's really tough. I base this statement on this. This is my personal opinion um, I think, as we talked about this before, I, 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 it's if when you begin to just horribly pervert children is when you can begin to see the, the end of the age. You know, we, the, the trafficking is at an all-time high. It's always happened. It's on an all-time high. Um, you know, or we, the pornography ring is, is horrible, including children. Um, now we have, you know, this, this mantra trying to transition our children at the age of five, you know, like five-year-olds don't even know if they want Captain Crunch or Lucky Charms, but they can choose whether or not they want to be a boy or a girl. Come on. That's perversion of who God created them to be. And when you begin to see all of this, you just can't help but believe that we're probably seeing more than we've ever seen before near the end of the age. This warning to them is just not a warning for them. It's also a warning to us. So let's continue with 9 through 13. Be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Before we go to verse 11, stop there for a moment. The believers are trapped in Jerusalem. They won't leave their home. Who wants to leave their house? Who wants to sell their property and move off to a land that they're not familiar with, even as Messianic Jews? Most people won't. 
If you became a believer in the current house you live in and you're a believer now, so you've been in that house as an unbeliever and a believer. Doesn't mean you're going to sell your house and move away. Unless God calls you into mission work, right? And there, there's some that have left. But I just want to remind you that a lot of people had not left Jerusalem. More on that in a moment, as I promised. And the gospel will first must be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death and father his child and children will raise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, I can't imagine reading this 100 years ago because everybody honored their parents. There were, sure, there's always been incidents of these things happening. Now you have these kids getting on TikTok and they're, they're you know, removing themselves from their family members at 10 and 12 and 13 years old because their parents aren't siding with what they want instead of just raising them and the kid falling in line and honoring mother, mother and father. You're seeing this more now than ever before. And it's just, it's sad. But one thing that's beautiful about this, and I don't want to lose this fact. And when you are being, that uh, they bring you to trial and deliver uh, you over, don't be anxious beforehand what you're going to be saying. Say, whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Have you ever had a moment where you're talking to somebody and you're just not really sure what to say and you finally just let go and let God and he just gives you the words on your tongues and speaks through you? That is reliance upon the Spirit of God to do exactly what he's told you he'd do for you anyway. But he's really warning those people at the end. That's hard for us to think about because, you know, I don't, I don't know that, again, in North America... We're not used to this idea. We're, we're just not used to this. This is occurring all over the world. At any time, in many countries, people are killed for their faith in Christ Jesus, arrested for their faith in Jesus. We're just not used to that. We see it. We pray for them. Amen. Glad we're free enough to still do that. But what happens, folks, the time comes where in North America, we don't have that option anymore. I know that isn't a comfortable topic, but are you prepared for that? If you're not, I would highly recommend that you think about it. Okay, sorry, not rainbows and lollipops that you wanted. Uh, I, don't, I don't sugarcoat the gospel because I can't. Now I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to have the joy of the Lord as that is my strength. And I'm going to disciple make and I'm going to walk in every morning and I'm going to get my hug from Miss Bev. And we're going to catch up on the last previous day's stuff for a couple minutes. And I'm going to go on and try to be as joyful as I can. Unless, you know, I'm struggling in my, in my walk, struggling in my work. But I always have the joy of the Lord in me. I don't think about worrying about this stuff. But believe you me, if it comes down to it and my Lord needs me to do that, Amen. Amen. Come on. Amen. What are we going to do? But the one who endures to the end will be what? Saved. John Calvin once said, our Lord's design in these words is to relieve the disciples from the anxiety which interferes with the cheerful discharge of our duty when we doubt our inability to sustain the burden. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. That's right. And this is something that the, 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 the apostles needed to know. They needed to know. They heard it, they, mm, and look at what every one of them did. They took it all the way to their death. They did not forget his words. One of them was beaten with little rods, little sticks. Any of you ever had to pick your switch? <laughs> now imagine being beaten to death with switches. How long would that take? No, maybe not, unless the switches are small. Well, it would depend. No, hang on a minute. Think about this. What if it took six hours? What if it took six hours because they weren't hitting any of your extremity, like your brain or your heart? What if they were just beating your body? How would that feel? And we had a disciple take that punishment till his death. Okay, amen? Look, the point is, is that every one of them took 
punishment. They took martyrdom for their Savior. What a great way to look, however, at what Calvin reminded us of what Jesus said, because we are to take heart. No matter the warning to be prepared for the worst, we know that our hope, we hope in the perfect. I decided to interject this to make sure that you all have a joy in the, in the Lord this morning, but he already won. He, he's already won. It, the war's been won. When he returns, that's a wrap. He crushes his enemies underneath his feet. That's it. So our battles are what we are fighting. We fight battles today. Right? Just because you not, not have to uh, die or be, have a chance of dying for your faith today doesn't mean that you're not battling through the tribulation of kid pain. Amen? Ain't no pain like kid pain. Your kids going through some stuff. Amen? You know, we got people that are uh, uh, rushed to surgery last night. I want to pray for Brother Creighton. Um, had just all of a sudden hurt, went in. They did an operation on him. Praise God, he's good, but uh, very un, un, unplanned. Um, another sister in the church this week had went in for a biopsy, and they popped her lung instead. So then she had to get, get put in the hospital to, to get taken care of, but it was weak. She was weak, and now she's better, and she's healing and getting home and happy and praising the Lord, right? And um, Brother Guy's mom, I mean, there's always going to be something. Sister Lori, she went through, you know, she just had COVID. Then all of a sudden, you know, takes prednisone. Not good on you if you're diabetic, amen? So these things are not good on a body. And next thing you know, she's in ICU. You know, these things happen. These are our tribulations, brothers and sisters, these are our tribulations. We are going to face them. But what happens if they go from our daily trials to something more great? And I just want to make sure that we don't ever lose focus of this. Mark 13, 14 through 20. But excuse me for a moment. Kahawa. You're like, what's Kahawa? It's coffee to our brothers and sisters in Kenya. <clears throat> but when we see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop note go down, nor enter the house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. For, and alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there, were such, there will be such a tribulation as not has been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Roman historian Tacitus wrote, both men and women showed the same determination and if they were to be forced to change their home, they feared life more than death. That's how steadfast the Jewish army and people stood firm. Now, that's honorable. The reason why the Christians vacated is because Jesus told them, it's not about you. It's about my gospel. So when they saw the abomination of desolation, which occurred, which occurred once before, in 168 BC, the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth invaded Jerusalem and captured the city. And he marched into the Jewish temple and he erected a statue of the Greek god Zeus. And he was the first one to sacrifice a pig on the altar. This provoked such a revolt from the Jewish people that under the leadership of the Maccabees, they chased him out. They drove Antiochus and his army out. And they gained control for about 100 years until Pompey, not the city, but the Roman general, spelled differently, captured the Holy Land uh, for it under, and put it under Roman rule. Now, many ancient Jews viewed this, the actions of Antiochus Epiphanes as a fulfillment of Daniel 9.27, which said, on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. Yeah. Right there, right in the middle of that. On the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. 
let's see, the until the creed end is poured out on the desolator. If you read the entirety of verses 24 through 27, it begins with the decree that Cyrus, King Cyrus, ordered to let the Jews go back home. And this story is in Ezra 1. This is not then about epiphanies. Instead, it is not lined up with the timeline of what Daniel's prophecy was. But guess what year does? 70 AD. So when he said the abomination of desolation, okay, again, what is his answer? The question is dual. The answer is singular. So now we kind of got to go, well, what, is, what does that mean for us today? What is the abomination for us, to, uh, desolation for us today? Because if you read that, it talks about it being in a temple. Well, who is the temple? Christians. The church is the temple now of God. And so when you begin to see Christians worshiping other gods instead of Christ, that's the spirit of the Antichrist. And it's going to come more and more and more and more. It's incontrovertible that Titus' actions were specific, a specific fulfillment of Christ that he warned in, in Mark 13, 14. And the parallel would be Matthew 24, 15 when they stand in the holy place. So this is really beautiful that the Lord gives us this understanding of what would occur at 70 AD and then what would occur near the end of the age. Mark 13, 21 through 27. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. It, but in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the coming, see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Okay. I, there's could be much debate about this, but I don't think debating about it is important. I think seeing what Jesus is saying here is what's important. And what he's saying here in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened. This is going to be a difficult time for Christians at the end of the age. It will be a difficult time for Christians at the end of the age. And they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. We will see this. This will be a visible moment in redemptive history. What a beautiful, blessed moment it will be that we get to see our Lord returning. After we see the returning of him, returning, trumpet blowing, everybody will see it, everybody will know. Then, he says in verse 27, he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. He will gather us to meet him in the air. Yes, the rapture will occur, but I do not believe it's secret because our Lord doesn't talk about it being secret. He talks about it being very much something that everybody will see, okay? And that, again, if I'm wrong, I get to go with you. <laughs> However, I just want to focus on what our Lord has said and not the tradition of people, Okay. Um, let's, let's look at Mark 13, 28 through 37. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. See, also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Praise God for that. But concerning the day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, and when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. 
This is not telling you that you can't sleep at night when you're tired. This is telling you to be on guard. This is telling you to not be a lazy Christian. This is telling you to do exactly what it is you're meant to do. And what are you meant to do? What did he say at the Great Commission? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go live your life. Stop at Baskin Robbins and get an ice cream cone on your way home tomorrow night. Do whatever it is you're going to do. Live your life. Be the light to everybody around you. But remain salty. Don't get lazy. Christian, do not get lazy on the Lord. That's what he's telling us to do. Stay awake. Stay frosty. We're not meant to do anything else than do exactly what it is we're supposed to do. If things get hairy, okay, we still do what we're supposed to do. We still have the Spirit of God leading us, directing us. So do not leave here today scared of what will happen. But I already told you that Jesus has won. What will it require of us? We don't know. But he does not give us a specific time. <laughs> I had to. I had to do it just because the other day was so funny. And I make comments about the, you know, I don't like the channel, the inspirational channels. I don't because there's so many false teachers on there. They all sided together with each other. It's just very difficult. I, I want to read the word of God and find my theology from Christ. What I, my son told me the other day was a funny, it was like an information on a particular episode of the 700 Club, which I, I kind of giggled at the information, but I went ahead and he left it on the channel and then he went and did something else and it's on the channel and I'm doing a project. Then I hear this, this guy talking and this guy in the next segment was talking about, and I was like, oh yeah, I went and turned the TV off after this. But he said, um, we was talking about these blood moons and the Jewish calendar. <sighs> Stop. What is that going to do for you? What do you say? Look at the fig tree. When you see it blooming in the spring, you know you've got close to summer and you can get the fruit in the fall. Look, for, there's a falling away of people. We're seeing it today. Don't worry about it. Focus on Christ and his disciple making. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to crawl into a bunker and wait for his return. We can't. Does this mean we can't tell if it's going to be in our lifetime it doesn't matter it doesn't matter he says stay awake and this isn't in reference to again i was catching sleep it's just us being prepared you know the ele the lessons that are found in mark 13 luke 17 and matthew 24 and 25 all corroborate with each other they apply to us today and we can read them with heart uh, you know, felt an emotion of knowing that he's in control. We have seen that although Jesus' predictions were fulfilled in the fall of AD 70, it is also appropriate to see the complex events Jesus describes in his discourse as a type and foreshadowing of the final judgment on all people and the consummation of our Savior's kingdom. That's what I'm looking forward to because we get to watch it. Yeah, I know. It's a little, call me weird. That's fine. I want to watch the destruction of people who have hated my God. They had a chance. They rejected him. They put him on a cross, and today they mock him. They mock him who saves you and I. I have issue with that. I have issue with that because he died for me. He rose for me. And I think about that now, and I'm like, I will not lay down. I will defend his truth. We do not know all the events and trials that will precede his final visible return, but we do know that we must be faithful wherever the Lord has placed us until his final appearance. Take heed and take courage, my fellow saints, because he has won the war, even when the battle today might seem bleak at times for us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for bringing us together, and thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us through our difficult times. We want to pray for the brothers and sisters also of difficult times, those who struggle around the world. And it's difficult talking with some of our friends um, in other places, in China, North Korea, um, even in South Korea, and, uh, you know, Lord God, in Taiwan, they're fearing for their life that 
Um, China may invade them, and so our brothers and sisters there are very, you know, they're worried that their the Chinese government will take them over, and but at the same time that they're ready for it, for it because they know that whatever your will is for their lives, your, may your will be done. Uh, there's wars and rumors of wars. But we know, Lord God, we're watching the lesson of the fig tree. But we're not worried about it because we're just focused on teaching your children about you. It's in your precious holy name we pray. And all of God's children said, amen.